Let's get into the Word of God this morning. Um, this morning I want to talk to you about living above the ordinary. Living above the ordinary and the empowerment of prayer and fasting. And, um, you know, uh, this, this word kind of dropped on me because prayer, and, well, let me just say this. Prayer and fasting is something that we've spoke about in the past, but this is something that we need to revisit over the context of a year at least a couple times because it's so important. When we decide to incorporate fasting with our prayer life, and of course the reading of the word, something happens. Things happen within us, the spirit of God within us. I'm telling you, things become alive. You're, and we're going to look at some of that stuff today. So it's a really important subject. Also, at the beginning of the year, CCF Ministries and other churches um, have jumped into a 21-day fast for the beginning of the new year. And, um, and we're with that, too. We began it last Monday. So if you haven't joined and you would like to jump into fasting, we're going to, towards the end of the message, show you how you can do that and on a level that you're comfortable with, you can sacrifice this and sacrifice some food, and then you, you'll see how God will work in your life. It's powerful. And there's something about the first, the first of the year, and as we're dedicating it to the Lord, but in the Old Testament, the first was really significant. The Israelites would give the first of their herds, the first of their flocks, of their first fruit. So when all the crop came in, they gave the first 10% to the Lord as an act of honor, as an act of sacrifice, and as an act of worship to him. But what it did was it set them up for the rest of the year that they would walk in the full measure of God's blessing throughout the year, whether that's protection, whether that's enough crop for the entire community, whatever it is, it, it brought in God's best for them. Amen. So that's what we're doing. Why are we fasting 21 days? Because we're going to seek the face of God, what he wants and what he has and what he's called us to do for 2021, because he's got a big plan for us. He's got a purpose for us, for us to walk in all the things he wants us to do as the church of Jesus Christ. It's going to take empowerment. And I'm going to show you today how that's going to work. Amen. My hope this morning is that through this fast, some of us here will initiate, it'll be the some of it will we'll take it on and it'll it'll grow into like a lifestyle of fasting throughout different periods of the of the year. And just so you just to let you know, I've learned this. Never like the fast because I'm taking away something that I like and something that I need. But I found that when I sacrificed and I began with a meal and I prayed during that meal, God started to do something really different in my life. Amen. And I promise you, he'll do the same thing in you. So I want to, uh, we're going to talk about that this morning. And I want to build on the word um, that the word had given me last week to, and just to kind of summarize it quickly. If you, if you didn't hear that, go on YouTube. It's 15 minutes, but it's what the word had given me last Friday. But overall, the, uh, the thrust of the message last week was that God is well pleased with this church. Because number one, we, we are about his kingdom. We are we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the Bible clearly tells us that all these things will be added unto us. So what are all these things? Everything that, that he's really called us to do and all these things includes really blessing and, and favor, but it's also the movement of the gospel going forward. We're called to do that. All those things includes reaching the lost for the glory of the kingdom of God. Amen. That's part of the, all these things. It's not just a personal thing. There's a personal mandate that's attached to that to go out and touch the community around us. And I'll tell you what, you know, this church, we really do it right because we keep the main thing, the main thing. We love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, and mind first, and we love other people well. Love him first, we love others, and then everything else is going to work out well. This church really demonstrates John 13, 34, which says, love one another as I loved you. And we do. I continually hear, and you've heard me say it before, when people walk into the church, like it's different here. They can sense the palpable presence of the Holy Spirit because we truly do welcome him in. We don't say welcome Holy Spirit and make him sit in a corner and we dictate to him what he's going to do. I'm standing over there. My wife got a word. She let it go. And, and that's what happens. People come up. They want to share things because it's his service. It's not ours. We're just facilitating the thing. Amen. So we have to give him room, and this church does that, and I think it pleases him greatly because he's free to move. 
The Lord also pointed out that we're a unified church. It came up a couple times today when we are growing in oneness with the Father and oneness with each other. I want you to know that's a journey. Amen. But again, if we keep him the main thing as we're growing one with him and with each other, the strength of our unity, it will only, it will, <clears throat> pardon me, only increase from there. Um, so we're on the right track. We're doing well. The foundation of our church truly rests on Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the rock. He is the foundation or the cornerstone of our lives. I love what Ephesians 2.20 says. It says, together we are, the, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together with him, becoming holy, a holy temple for the Lord. So as we keep Jesus as the cornerstone of our lives, we begin to look like him more. We begin to act more like him, sound like him, and the strength of our relationship with him and with others is only going to increase. I want you to know every single one of us, not only here but out there, we are all designed for a relationship with him. You're designed for greatness in him. Every one of us is designed to walk in his favor, his blessing, which stems from that relationship. Amen. But we're also designed for impact. We've got to impact the world around us. We can't take what we got on a Sunday morning and be like, that was great. The worship and everything else, it was wonderful. We have to take and exercise it out there. Amen. We can't come to church and be like, all right, we're one and done. I put my Bible down till next Sunday. We got to be in the word, writing down scripture, going over that. Because when you feed yourself the word of God and you pray the word of God, your experience on a Sunday morning is going to be that much more powerful. Amen. That's what we're called to do. So how do we do all this? How do we walk in the mandate? How do we achieve everything I kind of just said? When you add fasting to prayer, it's powerful. A friend of mine once said, when you couple prayer and fasting, it's like the atomic bomb of the Holy Spirit going off that releases the supernatural hand of God in your life in all your circumstances. It dials you into the heartbeat of God. It creates a sensitivity to the movement of the Holy Spirit within your life. The Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit become active. It obliterates the work of the enemy and the walls of the enemy that he tries to put up in front of you to try to prevent you from going forward, they get bulldozed. He could put up a front, but he's going to get run over. And here's the great thing. He knows that. And it's all done because of prayer and fasting. It's powerful. I've learned in my walk with God that, that the enemy completely hates a praying believer, but he is absolutely terrified by a believer who prays and fasts because fasting strengthens the very thing in which you wage war against him the spirit of God within you. See, he doesn't want you doing that. He wants you to remain in the flesh and your emotions and getting angry and getting upset because someone wronged you, whatever it might be. But you know what? When you stay in the spirit and you, and you build your spirit person up, which you'll look at in a minute, and you strengthen yourself in him, the stuff that tries to drag you back over here into the carnal world, it's like this wonderful protection rises up. You get to see what's going on. The enemy wants you with me. The enemy wants you to step into the, into the flesh because he'll own you in the flesh. He works through the flesh. So the way to protect yourself, we're in this. Look, we're in the flesh, right? We live, this is here. The only time we're not going to feel this thing is when we're standing face to face with Jesus. But until that time, it's about prayer, fasting, reading his word. And you're going to be all right, I promise you. All right, we can close the service now, but I'm going to give you some more details about that. The enemy really can do nothing against a believer who walks in the full power of the Holy Spirit. All right. And here's how this works. Fasting weakens your flesh. All right. It weakens your fleshly desires and it sensitizes the Holy Spirit within you so you can hear better and you can see things differently. In other words, you become more sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I love what Jesus said in Mark chapter four verses 23 and 24 he says if anyone hears has ears to hear let him hear he's saying pay attention to what you hear says the lord so jesus is talking to the disciples he's giving them this story it's a parable about a secret or a hidden truth regarding the kingdom of god but he looks at them and he says listen in order to really see this or hear what i'm saying there's two things that really have to happen number one you got to want to see it 
Secondly, it's only going to come by looking at things through the lens of the Holy Spirit, because this truth, you're not going to receive the natural way of seeing and hearing. It's a spirit thing. Amen? It's a perception. He's saying, look at it through this lens, the lens of your heart, the lens of my spirit. And this is where discernment starts to grow, and you start to see things that the natural eye really can't identify. By fasting, you weaken your flesh, and your spirit rises up to see and hear with greater clarity. And this is why it's so important, because as I, as I kind of said a moment ago, the flesh and the spirit are never going to be on the same page. They're not. The Bible says the flesh is at war with the spirit. Galatians 5.17 says, for the, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, but the spirit, what? is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do what you want. Romans 8, 5 says, those who live according to the flesh and set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Fasting weakens the part of you that gets in the way of the Spirit person within you. Amen? Amen? It's an empowerment that's only going to come when you include fasting in your prayer life. Fasting is like throwing gasoline on the flame of the Holy Spirit within you. It's going to incinerate anything within you that has no resemblance of the Father. You get to see yourself differently, the world around you differently. You're going to look at people differently. It fuels the gifts of the Holy Spirit within you. It increases your faith, and I'm telling you, it will drive out unbelief. It'll raise your faith, and it's going to prompt you to action. It's going to give you a boldness that you haven't had before. Sometimes when you kind of apprehension to, to, to kind of step up and step in and communicate something, all of a sudden, when you kick in fasting to your prayer life, all of a sudden, this boldness rises up within you, and it almost like you now, now it's on. You're, now, now you're looking for stuff to do. You'll be walking out there, you'll be talking to different people, and then all of a sudden, you feel the unction of the Holy Spirit come in and say, they need a touch from me, go up there. I went to the gun range last week, I walked in there, there were three guys in there doing some electrical work. I walk in, and I'm like, is the range open? And they're like, well, the guy's coming in 10 minutes to check to make sure everything's working fine, you can't go in yet. So they're like, so what are you doing? They said, I'm a pastor. And that was it for the next hour and a half. All I did was give him Jesus. I answered every single one of their questions. I prayed over a guy. All his pain went. And I said, look, if you want Jesus alive and well in your life, he'll eat you. I promise you. It's different. I don't know what you've ever learned about, about Jesus, but let me just tell you something. He's a friend and he loves you and he wants to be a part of your life. And if you want that, I just, I don't even remember what I said. I just gave a, a, an opportunity to come and accept Jesus as their savior. And, a guy, and I'm like, if you want that, you just here's, the, here's what you say. It's got to come from your heart. And I said, what it is? And one guy's like, yeah, that's me. I, I'm in. And I'm like, all right, brother. You said you had pain. Where is it? In the back. And I'm like, all right, let me pray for you. I didn't do the healing. God did the healing. But, but because of prayer and fasting, and look, it's not, I'm not, it's not a show about me. I just learned the power of stepping into something that he tells us to do. He calls us to pray and fast. He goes, listen, when you fast, it's not like an option. But when we step into that, he steps in in a greater way, and they're changed. I even told them there was another kid there. His name's Emmanuel, and I hope he's listening. And I kept looking at him, and I said, Emmanuel, I'm just going to tell you right now. You have, like, pastor written all over you. And then the Lord says to me, he says, I said, uh, he's telling me one thing, and I'm asking him. I said, Emmanuel, did you used to go to a Baptist church, a white church? He goes, yeah. And I'm like, okay, Good. The Lord is calling you back home because your friends are trying to pull you away from him. God's got a purpose and a plan for you. And it's not that this isn't it, but he's got a greater plan for you because you're a pastor. I'm telling you right now. So hear what I'm saying. You need to get away from your friends that are trying to work you over and keep you. There's a line there. And I showed him a line there and I said, you're here on the fence and your friends are pulling you this way, but you know you shouldn't. So you work your way over this way. But if you keep hanging with them, it's going to be there for good. And he just stared at me and he goes, he's looking at me. And I said, the Lord just shows you that. But you have, a, you, you have something to do. Make it right with God. The point of this is this. 
when we fast, it's like we get an uptick of the power and the presence of God in our life to do the work of the gospel. We do a great job with loving people and we love them well. And I'm not saying we're missing it out there, but the other side of that is the works of the gospel. He wants us to step into the works part of it. When we step into fasting, he's going to empower you. And the intimidation, the lack of boldness, it gets incinerated. And he empowers you. And now you just go and do. Amen? It's nothing to be afraid of. Welcome it and watch. And you're done with it. And you're like, oh my gosh, that was, that was the most exciting thing I think I've ever done in my life. And you, you, honestly, you don't even remember what you say or do, but you knew it was good because you gave him a position in your life to go and act. Amen? He's empowering us to do the work of the gospel. I want to share a story with you in Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 21. Or 29. In this story, um, the story, there's a lot going on in the story, but the, the main thrust of the story is the disciples were unable to remove a demon from a kid. So we're going to go in, I'm going to bring out some of the truth of this, but I'm going to show you why this is really important. So let's read it together. Beginning in verse 14, New King James. So I'm just getting it up there. And it says this, it says, And when he had came to the disciples, he saw the great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them. Immediately when he saw them, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought my son who has a mute spirit Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and he said, Oh, faithless generation, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, he immediately, I'm sorry, when he saw, when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed. He fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Jesus hasn't even done a thing yet, but the mere presence of Jesus Christ and a demoniac is working that, the, 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 that demonic spirit over already. The thing is getting agitated. It wants nothing to do with Jesus. It just doesn't want him here. That's what happens. But I love this. And that's what happens with a spirit-filled believer. Demons are going to get twisted up at your very presence. It's true. Verse 21. <clears throat> so he asked his father, how long has he, this been happening? And he said, from childhood. And, also, and often he's thrown him both into fire and the water to destroy him. And I love this question here. It says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, believe. And he wasn't being rude with him. He's making a point here. If you can believe, all things are possible for those who believe. We got a group of guys following Jesus, can't get the work done, not putting them down, just identifying. But it centers around lack of faith and unbelief, period. And I want to show you something here. Verse 25, when Jesus saw the people came running to, together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said, deaf, dumb, and spirit, I command you to come out and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and he came out of him. And he become as dead, so many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Now, love, this is like the, uh, the Monday morning, you know, coaching moment after the Sunday game. Jesus had come to the house. 
And his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we do it? Why? So Jesus said, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. So I want to draw your attention to some things in this passage. The major theme that's running through this passage is lack of belief and unbelief. Lack of faithlessness, lack of faith and unbelief. In verse 17, we see the boy comes to the father. He has a conversation with Jesus. He gives the history of his son. And this guy's exhausted. It seems like since obviously he said from when he was a little boy, I don't know how old the young man is, but this man is exhausted. He's tired and he wants relief. And Jesus asks um, in the conversation, as I just covered, he asks, how long has he been this way? And he, he clarifies it for him. But the boy says to Jesus, he said, you know, I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do it. And when Jesus had asked the father, or when the boy's father had asked Jesus, he said, but if you can, can you help us? I want you to see something in this. The father's questioning of Jesus had nothing to do with Jesus's willingness to do it. Listen, it's not that big of an area. Everybody knows who Jesus is. Everybody knows what he's capable of doing. But he's asking him a question. Can you heal him? And he's asking for a reason because he recognizes that when he went to the guys that are following Jesus, they weren't able to do it. And he hangs out with them. So the question becomes, he's seeing the inability of the disciples to deliver the boy, which causes the boy's father to question Jesus whether he has the ability to do it. How many times have people gone in? They, and, and, this is, and this is how, I gotta be very careful how I say this. Bad theology happens this way. They go in with an expectation. The expectation doesn't happen based on the, what the Word of God says. So what do people do? They fit the Word of God into their expectation and they minimize the Word of God. In other words, their truth is their truth and how they feel. And they take the Word of God and it becomes sub to the way they see things. Does that make sense? Okay. This is exactly what happens. This is how you get craziness where people say, well, if it's your will, he'll be healed. Well, let me just tell you how the cross works. In a, in a, I gotta be very careful because I get cynical. I'm down on the back right now. The cross is complete. The cross covers everything. If it could raise the dead, and it does, it's gonna heal anybody. So the fact remains, if someone's not getting it done, it's not Jesus. We don't have all the answers. And to try to play the middleman and try to figure out how and when and why and why not, it never should minimize the power of the gospel and the truth of the gospel, but that's exactly what happens. We get wrapped up in our mind and we look at why things don't happen and say, well, it doesn't work. Why would I want to follow him? See, that's what's happening to him. I brought my guy, I brought my kid to your guys. They follow you, right? They do stuff, but they couldn't do this. So are you able to do it? Because they couldn't. That's a problem. So if something doesn't happen. We can't blame Jesus. We can't minimize the word of God. Trust me, I've prayed when my back was really bad, not being able to walk for two weeks, looking at the gospel, and I'm like, they prayed over me, it hasn't happened. And then the finality of my healing came like 11 years later. All the way through, there was a lot of learning in the way. I can give you a whole bunch of stuff in there. But it certainly wasn't immediate for me. But I had good teaching and they told me, don't get mixed up in what doesn't happen. Just look at the word of God and look at what does happen. And it will happen. And it did. Not only that, the word says a creative miracle is going to happen. Believe for the impossible. It's hard to believe for the impossible Lord, when your word says immediately the guy was healed. And it's not immediate for me. But when I believed, I trusted the word of God over my experience. Here's what happened. I went, brand new disc in my back. Complete creative miracle. Wasn't even thinking that. I had no concept of that God would even do that. My mind was limited to what a doctor can do. While they're working on new discs they're inserting in people's backs, maybe that's what God has in mind. And I'm not minimizing that. I think it's brilliant. I think it's wonderful that we have a medical society that can actually do that. But God's like, listen, I'm still greater than that. So watch what I'm going to do. I had no concept until it happened. Amen? Okay. I'll move on. The 
The narrative here is really important. We do. The narrative is really important here because so much is being communicated. But after these events, when they, when they were back at the house, he tells them why they couldn't do it. He identifies it's, you know, it's this one comes out by prayer and fasting, but he's also showing them something else. Jesus is also identifying that lack of prayer breeds unbelief and faithlessness. That's why we can't hang here for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning and think we're going to make it seven days. Can't. It'll fill you up, but your tank's going to be dry by Tuesday night. You got to fill up daily. Pick up a thing and say, Lord, what do you want me to show me here? Even if it's like five minutes, give it to him. And if you only got five minutes, trust me, the Lord can speak in five minutes. Amen. But we got to fill ourselves daily. Jesus was also pointing out that, or actually it was a commentator I read, and I thought this guy was so accurate. It really, really kind of stuck with me. But he said, inconsistent, isolated times of prayer, not isolated, separating, but inconsistent times of prayer, not enough to raise your faith, to develop the spiritual power and authority to work against that kind of a, a foe. He said, if you want to walk, work in the capacity that Jesus did in what he's called us to, it's going to take prayer and fasting. This guy went on to say, adding fasting to a lifestyle of uh, prayer increases your anointing, it increases your authority, it increases your boldness, which we said, it increases your faith and removes unbelief and empowers you to do the works of Jesus Christ. And he has called us to do that. He clearly tells us, Jesus told, told his disciples, so this is for us. John 14, 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done because... And even greater works will he do because I go back to the Father. So the mandate of fasting is for us now. But to complete what he's telling us to do there, he's saying you have to pray and fast. So in this story, again, Jesus is adequately trying to prepare his disciples for the work of what he's calling them to do. And I'll tell you what, I don't know the end of the story here, but I know it resonated with them. Because in Luke's gospel, this story in Luke, I think, is in, in, in chapter 9. In chapter 10 of Luke's gospel, I love this story because Jesus is sending out the disciples in the 72. He says, listen, he tells them what to do. He goes, you guys are going to go out there and you're going to go and do this, that, and the other thing. You can read the story. But he, they come back and they're overjoyed. They're overjoyed. They're like, and the first thing they say to him, Jesus, you're not going to believe this. Even the demons bow. Even the demons, where's, I'll, I'll quote it to you. Where am I at here? He said, even demons are subject to your name. Something happened in that little meeting because the very thing they couldn't do previously, they're doing now. They recognize that the, the enemy is subject to whatever they say. It's such a powerful story. My encouragement for you this morning is this. Fasting with your prayer life, reading the word of God is going to radically change your walk in him and your empowerment. Listen, with all the nonsense and the craziness of this world, the church has been given the mandate. We have everything we need by virtue of the Holy Spirit to lead a lost and dying nation to the only one that's going to save their soul. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. But we got loving people down really well. We really do. And I'm not putting a ding on everybody, but I'm telling you, please, I'm encouraging. Step into this. Watch what God's going to do in your life. And then in moments here and there, he's going he's to tap you on the shoulder. He's going to put you into the game. And God's going to work powerfully. I promise. He's just looking for a willing vessel. vessel. Amen. I'm going to pause for a minute. I want to talk to you real quick about four different times, uh, types of fasting. And then I'm going to pray and we're going to close out. You have uh, the first one. It's called an absolute fast. This is no food, no water. Three days is the absolute max on this kind of a fast because if you go four or five days without water, you will no longer, you will see Jesus in a completely different way. You'll die. You can't do that. Um, I, um, I'm just going to say this right now. This is being recorded, isn't it? Maybe, Zach, you could pull that little segment out. Um, this kind of a fast is, um, it, this is one that you would really probably want to talk to your physician about. Um, a normal fast is abstaining from food, but drinking lots of water. And there are several choices within that. You may want to, if you eat three meals a day, 
maybe not eat breakfast or maybe not eat lunch or maybe not eat dinner, but you know, what it pick one meal out of the day. And in that time you're supposed to eat instead of going on lunch or whatever it is. That's when you pray. You're separating yourself from food and then you're incorporating prayer into that time when you're supposed to be eating. And then if you want to up it a little bit, you can fast lunch and breakfast or lunch and then have dinner. And in those times, pray. If you want to up it a little bit more, just give up three meals a day and go for it. Now, if you've never fasted before, I don't recommend a 21 day fast of going with no food. I just don't. This is something God's not trying to hurt us here. He's trying to build himself up within us, the spirit within us. We have to do this where it's at your level. But the wonderful thing about fasting, when you when you step into it on whatever level, I want you to hear this. In whatever level you step into it, if it's important to you, it's important to him. Amen? If you're giving up one meal, he's going to honor you in that one meal. If you do it more than that, he's going to honor you. Amen? So another fast is called the partial fast. Daniel fast is a good, uh, a great example of this, where you abstain from all animal products, including meat, dairy, eggs, or really anything made of sugar, bread, and caffeine. So you're really only eating fruit, vegetables, beans, and again, you drink a lot of water. And before there's a liquid fast where it's only water broth. I've added coffee into that one myself. However, if the Lord says no coffee, then it's no coffee. And again, how you jump into this thing is between you and the Father. And whatever you decide to do, he is going to honor. I promise you he will. Amen? All right. I'm going to finish with this. There's my last sheet here. Fasting with prayer. This is what it's going to do in your life. It's going to set the stage for a miracle in your life. It's going to release God's power in your life in a much greater way. It's going to bring supernatural results to difficult life situations. It delivers supernatural provision, favor, protection. It empowers us to be the enforcer against the work of the enemy. Fasting brings Satan's defeat and your victory. Most importantly, fasting humbles the heart, realigns our lives, gives us a new awareness of God's purpose and presence and power in our lives. And I love this last link. I, I read this in a book from one of my friends. He wrote this. When you fast, you begin to experience the suddenlies. When you pray for healing, suddenly they're healed. When you pray for deliverance, suddenly they're delivered. Suddenly demons are leaving people. Suddenly there's a breakthrough in whatever the situation is in your life. It's powerful. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us this mandate. Lord, you've given us everything we need to move your gospel forward, to not only demonstrate the love, but the empowerment of your spirit as we're in the business of changing lives, oh God. And I thank you, Lord, for it. So, Father, I release over this group today. Hallelujah. I release, Father, a strong anointing over them, Lord. I release the power. Put your hands in the air and just receive this this morning. Father, I release anointing. I release power. I release authority, oh God, over each and every one of them. I release your joy unspeakable in the lives. I release your peace and your grace and your mercy over them. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that in this year, in 2021, it's going to be a game changer for this church. It's going to be a game changer for the each and every individual in here. But collectively in this city and surrounding areas, we are going to move your gospel forward. Lives are going to get saved. Lives are going to get healed. Lives are going to be set free, Father, in the name of Jesus. And it's happening with your church, your family right here, oh God. We release that to them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And as we step into fasting, giving you our best in the first of this year, it's an act of worship. It's an act of honor. It's an act of sacrifice. And Father, we know that you're going to maximize us for the glory of your kingdom, oh God. And we give you glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
And everybody said, Amen. God bless you this morning. Right in the nick of time, we got five minutes. All right, we'll go downstairs. We'll see you guys down there. We'll enjoy each other's company. Amen. God bless you this morning.